All right, test one, two, test. Testing the microphone, starting in one minute, making sure my microphone's working. Okay. Test, test, test. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and get started then. All right, well, good evening, everybody. And thank you for coming out on this uh, kind of wet, potentially rainy in the next few minutes evening here at Cantini Park. I wanna say a special hello to all of our guests who are joining us in person this evening and a very special um, hello to all of our guests who are joining us virtually this evening. As we are learning more about our hybrid format, we wanna thank everybody involved um, as we continue to learn. If there's any technical difficulties, we're gonna try and get through those as quick as possible. So we thank you for any grace that you grant us as we're learning. Uh, we also want to say a very special thank you to all of our friends at the American Legion Cantini Post 556 who are in the back of the room this evening and are collecting donations for the Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans. Uh, we also will be taking questions this evening at the end of the presentation. So for my guests who are watching us virtually, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. And for those of you who are in person at the end of the presentations, our friends Chris and Jackie will be walking around with microphones to take your questions. It is imperative if you are intending, attending in person to please wait for that microphone. Otherwise, our guests on Zoom will not hear the amazing questions you have. So make sure you're waiting for that microphone. There is so much happening at Cantini Park coming up that I want to share with everybody before we get started. So first and foremost, let's switch that slide up. Give me one second. Thank you. I didn't turn the remote on. <laughs> First and foremost, on Saturday, June 11th, starting at six o'clock, we have an outdoor concert in front of the First Division Museum. That is the Gilded Age Town Band. They're gonna be performing songs from the World War I era, and they're going to recreate an exact program that was performed by the 112th Infantry Regiment Band, 28th Division, AEF, in May of 1918, aboard the troop ship that carried the regiment to Liverpool, England. So that is gonna be a fantastic program. Please remember that that program is out outdoor. So bring your lawn chairs and your blankets. Next, we have our following date with history in collaboration with the amazing Alabrijes uh, Creatures of the Dream World that is here at Cantini Park this summer. We're going to bring you some fantastic stories of Mexican-American veterans, starting off with Patriots from the Barrio from Dave Gutierrez. It is the story of Company E of the 141st Infantry, and it is the only all Mexican-American Army unit that served in World War II. Continuing on with that, we know if you're a fan of Date With History, you are probably a fan of the Robert R. McCormick House's sister program, <laughs> Headlines from History, managed by our friend Chris at the back of the room. He's going to be bringing you the story of journalist Jovita Idar um, and her time as a Mexican-American reformer on June 23rd. Of course, there is so much more happening this month, so I want to encourage everybody to please go to fdmuseum.org to learn more about our vehicle displays. Tank, um, the tank is coming out tomorrow for our cruise night and our history hikes and so much more. But let's go ahead and get this presentation started. Everybody, please join me in welcoming our presentation this evening. His name is Steve Fixler. Steve spent 25 years in the U.S. Army in armor as both enlisted and as an officer, and he retired in 2004. He's been a volunteer here at the First Division Museum since 2005 and volunteers as both a docent in the museum and works with our historic motor pool vehicle fleet. We are so excited to have him help us commemorate this today's commemoration of the 78th anniversary of D-Day by exploring the use of tanks on Omaha Beach. Everybody, please join me in welcome Steve Fixler. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank, um, thank you coming out. Thank you all for coming out for the presentation today. And like uh, Laura said, today's the 78th anniversary of the invasion of D-Day and everything like that. So tonight we're gonna talk about the tank support at Omaha Beach at Normandy. And we're gonna talk about the initial tank landings, not the follow on forces, just the initial tank landings. There's a lot of information on the subject. And we're gonna talk a little bit of the overview of the landings and with some specific information on the um, tank support. We'll talk about the overall situation in Europe, the D-Day invasion situation, then we'll talk about the US planning, training, 
execution and results of the tank support at D-Day on Omaha Beach. Now, some of my information is a little contradictory. Believe it or not, there are historic, his, history books out there and historians that have different opinions on a few things here, some different facts here and there. Believe it or not, it's true. And so while I was doing some research, I had a little bit of uh, contradictory stuff. We'll talk a little bit about that too, though. So as we go here, whoa, that was supposed to be my title slide. Okay, here's the situation in uh, Europe in 1942. Red is occupied, is German occupied Eastern Europe and everything. Beginning in 1943, the Russians start to push the Germans out of Russia. By the end of September 43, the Germans are out of North Africa and Sicily and the allies are fighting in Southern, um, Southern Italy. By June 44, the Russians are in Eastern Poland and Eastern Romania. Stalin wants a second front opened up to relieve the pressure on Russia. Now, Germany still has complete control of Western Europe and it was time to invade Western Europe. Now the Germans were expecting it, but they didn't know when or where, but they were setting up their defenses to stop the invasion. When the, when the allies were planning the invasion, when they were planning the seaborne invasion, they had learned from their earlier amphibious landings in the Mediterranean area. Here. So you got up, ah, you got Operation Torch, 1942, the invasion of North Africa, invasion of Sicily right here in 43, Salerno in September 43, and Operation Shingle at Anzio in 44. These amphibious landings were lightly defended or not defended at all. Not a whole lot of obstacles. Sometimes the soldiers just walked onto the beach. It was after the landing that sometimes the fighting got intense but the landing in France would be different. Germans would be defending the coast. There would be some non-German troops like some Poles and Russians and maybe not all frontline German troops, but mostly Germans. But the reinforcements will be German units and a German counterattack was expected. There would also be fortifications with land and sea mines and obstacles. This wasn't going to be a walk on the beach like they had in a couple of earlier invasions. Tanks needed to be in the first wave to support the infantry and engage the Germans and help move up the beach. At Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, the US Army used Sherman tanks with deep wading kits. They had the deep wading kits that came off the, our, the landing craft. The Army was comfortable with that, the DW tanks. The Army was very comfortable with those. But let's look at the German defenses along the Atlantic coast. All right, for the past few years, the Germans were fortifying Western Europe from Denmark down to Spain. Some places were more fortified than others. Along with the German troops, there were beach obstacles, land and sea mines, bunkers, pillboxes, machine guns, trenches, artillery guns, and mortars. The Germans also had four regular German panzer divisions or tank divisions, plus three SS panzer divisions, plus other units in France, ready to counterattack any type of invasion that occurs. The powerful 21st Panzer Division was just north of Caen, and they were waiting to counterattack at the Allied landings, and they could hit the Allies right at their beaches. What the Allies had to do, the British and the US, they had to find a weak spot in the German coastal defenses in an area that they conduct an amphibious landing and exit from the beach, then establish a beachhead, defend against the German counterattack, and then continue combat operations through France. Hey, that's all they had to do. Pretty simple, huh? Plus the weather and the sea conditions had to be in their favor. German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, have you guys heard of Erwin Rommel? He was in charge of the Atlantic Wall and he was worried about Normandy. He felt that it was a good place for the allies to land. Therefore he, <clears throat> therefore he put more emphasis on the defenses there. Well, let's go to the map of Overlord right here or D-Day but the allies still decided to land on Normandy because based on their intelligence, the German troops were weak there. And though they had some ob obstacles and defenses there, the Navy and Air Force could neutralize the obstacles and defenses. And they believed that Normandy was the best place to conduct an amphibious landing and move inland. The US will land, whoops, come back here. The US will land the 1st Infantry Division and the 29th Infantry Division at Omaha Beach, 
4th Infantry Division at Utah Beach. The Rangers will take Point to Hawk, and then the British will go to at Gold, Juneau, and Sword Beaches. And then at Utah Beach, the 82nd and 101st will land behind the lines, and the British 6th Airborne Division will land here. No airborne units landed behind Omaha Beach. They did not, only Utah Beach and the British beaches. The 741st Tank Battalion. 741st will support 1st ID, 743rd will support the 29th ID, and then the 70th will support 4th ID right there. Now, a little kind of a blow up map of o Omaha Beach. 741st commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Skaggs right here will support the 16th Regimental Combat Team, the 16th Infantry Regimental Combat Team commanded by Colonel Taylor. That's the first wave for the 1st Infantry Division. The 743rd Tank Battalion, Colonel Upham, will support the 116th Infantry Regiment from the 29th ID, as that's the first wave going to Omaha Beach. Okay, let's get a little bit closer now to Omaha Beach. Anybody been to Omaha Beach at all? Okay, so you may have seen some of the stuff, at least post-World War II, Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach was the last six miles wide. The western third of the beach was backed by a seawall 10 feet high, and the whole beach was overlooked by cliffs around 100 feet high. The beach was made up of sand and shingles. Do you guys know what shingles are? They're kind of stones, small stones up to about stones the size of an apple. You, if you walk, tank drives over those, the stones will get in the tracks, which will lift the track up and the tank, the track will come off the tank. So the tankers have to be very careful about driving on the shingles. There were five exits from the beach. One was a paved road, two dirt roads and two dirt paths. They were all through gullies covered by German positions. Now the German 716th Infantry Division was defending Omaha Beach and along the coast. So the whole division was along the coast and their 726th Infantry Regiment was at Omaha Beach, just the one regiment. It was an understrength unit consisting of older Germans and older German conscripts, and they were 35 years and older. Plus they had a unit of former Soviet soldiers. There were Soviets and some Poles that were at uh, the beaches during the invasion. This was a static division, meaning that they just fought from their bunkers. They were not mobile. They just stayed in their position. They fought from Widerstand nesters. You all got that? Widerstand nesters, resistant nests, or WN or Whiskey Novembers. They were strong points. And in, a, in one of the strong points, you could have two to three bunkers, rifle, uh, infantry guys with rifles, machine guns, and AT guns. So that wasn't just one bunker. They were two or three bunkers together in one of the resistance nests, and they were all interlocked together. There were 13 of these uh, resistance nests. They were, had bunkers, pillboxes, anti-tank guns, 85 pre-sighted machine guns, mortars and artillery guns, plus they had an extensive trench system. 85 pre-sighted machine guns. That along with everything else, the Germans covered Omaha Beach, every piece of sand was covered by some type of weapon system. Whether it was a machine gun, artillery, mortars, anti-tank guns, they had it completely um, covered. Not only that, they set it up so you're going to have crossfire from the ground and fire from the top of the cliffs, uh, fire from the, some of the um, bunkers and pillbox from the top of the cliff. Here are the strong points up here. These are in black. You see the uh, Whiskey November 60 go across here. These two are guarding that exit. That's 1st uh, Infantry Division exit E3, 1st Infantry Division exit E1. Again, two of them right there. For the 29th, exiting at D3, you've got some right there, and then come down here. All the exits that they wanted to go through had at least two or three resistance nests right there guarding the gully to include the beach and everything like that. Along with the weapon systems, the waters and the beaches were heavily mined with sea mines and land mines, and they had multiple types of obstacles. Anybody heard of a Belgian gate? That there is the Belgian gate, made up of metal and everything like that. They were all along the beach. Log posts with mines on top of the log posts. 
log ramps, these ramps going up, mine, a mine, and a mine right there. Plus they had hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are those metal girders that are put together that look like an X almost. And they had um, barbed wire and everything like that. Now, this nest was actually, go back, was actually right here in the 1st Infantry Division sector, Whiskey November 6-2. And it consisted of 27 German tanks, four machine guns, two 75 millimeter artillery guns, and two anti-tank guns. That was the most powerful resistance nest, and it was in the 1st ID section. But what also happened there is Field Marshal Rama. Remember I said that he was worried about Normandy? He moved the 352nd Infantry Division into Normandy. It was made up of experienced soldiers from the Eastern Front and quite a few new conscripts. They were pretty full strength. They had some pretty good equipment and they were fairly strong. So the US troops are gonna to have to jump off the landing craft, the troopers that is. They're gonna to have to wade through the water get through all the obstacles, mines, cross over 300 yards of open beach, get to the seawall and find the exits. They got to do all that while being shot at and shooting the Germans at the same time. As you can see, the Germans were well armed and in good defensive positions. Field Marshal Rommel built a formidable defense there. Omaha Beach was a killing zone. It really was put together pretty well and everything like that. I said that the 30, 50, 352nd German Infantry Division was there. Anybody seen the movie, The Longest Day? Okay, you guys remember Major Puskat? He's played by Hans Christian Black. He's the artillery officer in the bunker that's looking out and he says, oh my God, they're coming, the ships, the invasion, it's coming here. He was with the 352nd. He was one of the ar artillery guys with the 352nd. Okay, looking again, this gives you another idea of how the obstacles were set up at Omaha Beach. They land right here, the tankers and the infantry, they gotta get through the log posts, the log ramps, the hedgehogs, different types of landmines, the barbed wire and the seawall while being shot at and while trying to destroy these items here and trying to get through the gully. The hell of a thing to try to do. How big were these log ramps? These guys can walk underneath them. They were, that's how big these log ramps were. They can probably walk right underneath us right here. And they're all along Omaha Beach and parts of other beaches too. Okay, I said the tanks were gonna be in the first wave. Some of you may have looked at the posters over there. And these are the three type of tanks they're going to use. They're all three are Sherman tanks. This here is the deep wading tank. This is the duplex drive tank, otherwise known as a DD and otherwise known as a Donald Duck tank. And this right here is a DW tank with the blade and everything like that. Uh, this dozer blade right here proved to be very invaluable. Now, with the dozer tank, whoops, this is too tight for me here. The main gun and the tank fully operational. Okay, they just happen to have a blade in front of it too, but it's fully operational. And both tanks, uh, both M4 and M4 Sherman tanks were used. Each of the tanks have a five-man crew. You've got the tank commander, gunner, and loader in the turret, but there's only one hatch. That hatch is over the tank commander's head. All three guys have to go in the turret that way, and all three have to get out that way. The driver is on the left side of the tank. He's got his own hatch, and the assistant gunner, uh, the assistant driver, bow machine gunner, is on the other side of the Sherman tank on the right side. He would be on this side right here, and he has his own tank. Many of the US generals and officers did not like the DD tank. A lot of them hated it. They did not trust it. <clears throat> US Army General, General Giroux, Fifth Corps commander, commander at Omaha Beach did not like the DD tanks. He did not trust them. He went to General Bradley, commander of both beaches. He said, I, I don't trust it and they made a deal. Two tank companies would be DD, and one tank company would be DW, and I'll explain that shortly. Okay, as we get into more detail, here is the deep waiting tank right here. The landing crafts were to take the DW tanks to the shore and drop them off in seven feet of water. They would go off the landing craft into the water and drive onto shore. These are not the swimming tanks, okay? The DW tanks are not the swimming tanks. The driver and the assistant driver's hatches are water sealed 
and so is the turret. So the hatches right here are sealed, water sealed, and so is the turret right there. You've got the air intake for the engine and the exhaust for the engine over um, behind it. All tank crew members were in positions while on the landing craft getting ready to go off because they may have to fire immediately once they hit the water, once they hit the beach. And some DW tanks fired at the Germans while in the landing craft. That'd be a hell of a shot to do that, but some of them did fire while on the move. Once on the beach, they had to pull the pins on the shrouds to drop the shrouds. And I read one account on Utah Beach where one of the drivers got out of the tank. He had to relieve himself quickly because he was a little nervous. He pulled the pins and the shrouds fell off right away. It was pretty simple to take them off and everything like that. Now, here's one carrying a trailer. Notice the name, Adeline 2. The trailers were invaluable because they carried more ammunition, but they were a pain to back up on. When you're on the beach, you have to back up. They had troubles backing up the trailer on the beach. Can you imagine backing up a trailer on hard ground? There you had to do it on the beach. Here's a picture of putting the shrouds on and some of the testing right here. And some more practice. That's not a full landing craft, but they're just doing some training. Who do you think's inside this tank right here? You think the driver's in there or something like that? I was a tanker for 25 years. I'm not doing that. I'm sorry. I'll try somebody else to do it. And um, okay, here's another DW tank. I'm showing this, it looks like he's backing up. Tank commander's backing up. He's got his hand mic right there, talking to his driver. There's a picture of the shrouds, no loader's hatch. If you have to get out of the tank, whether in land or whatever, three guys gotta go through one hatch to get out, the, get out of the tank. Speaking of Adeline II, this is a picture of Adeline II in France. Um, in France, it took a hit at the bogey wheel right there, but it's still able to be uh, towed. What I wanna show you on this is that's what it looks like without the shrouds. You pulled the pins, the shrouds came off. Now, throughout the battle in Western Europe and looking at tanks, I don't remember seeing any with shrouds on. So if there was any with shrouds on, maybe they um, unwelded it. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but they took them up, they unwelded them or something like that. Duplex drive, DD, or some guys call them the Donald Duck tank. Um, the D duplex drive meant that it could swim using the propellers and drive onto the land using its track and everything like that. It swims like a boat. You see the canvas going around it. And uh, it has the struts right here. And inside the struts, they had air canisters to help keep it afloat. It would be launched in the water at about 6,000 to 7,000 yards, three and a half to four miles away. And the driver could drive it with the tank commander telling the driver where to go or the tank commander can control it on top of the tank with the steering sticks. There's some artillery sticks, whatever the Navy calls them. He can control it that way. I believe in all the DD tanks that the assistant driver, the gunner and the loader were on top of the tank while in the landing craft. I think just the driver was inside and the tank commander may have been inside or on top of it. Each tanker was given a May West light vest, seven minutes of oxygen, a small rubber raft to what, similar to what the pilots use and a huge knife to cut the canvas if they had to cut the canvas. Here's another picture right here. You see how it's floating. I mean, it's just almost underwater right there. Just a little bit of top is above it right there. The propellers are right here and that's the sea level. This is what it looks like when they landed on the beach and dropped the canvas, fully operational. The turret can turn and it can shoot. It doesn't shoot when it's in the water swimming because you'll put a hole in the canvas, but uh, you have to wait till you get to the beach. Good picture of the propellers. There's how it looks right there. A couple more examples. Okay, now you've seen the tanks and how the tanks are, how were the tanks transported to the beach? They were in two different types of landing crafts, LCTs, landing craft tanks. The, um, <clears throat> They would go for the DD tanks right here. They were lined up four in a row and at 6,000, 7,000 yards, three and a half to four miles, the landing craft would stop. It would drop its ramp. The tanks would drive onto the ramp and then off the ramp and ease into the water you hope. 
the ramp had an extension to help it ease into the water. Once in the water, the propellers would kick in and it would swim to the beach. That is these, that's this one right here. They were lined up four in a row like this. For the other landing craft, you had two DW tanks, and then that's the dozer tank behind it. That landing craft would go to the beach, stop at seven feet of water, drop its ramp, the tanks would go onto the ramp, onto the water, and then drive to the beach. Now, can anybody figure out how you figured out seven feet of water? I'm not sure. I think they just got as close as they could, and yeah, it's good enough. Boom, now if they went. They were probably a little nervous too at the time, and I don't blame them or anything like that. Here's, I think this is a training exercise. You got uh, some DW tanks right there. They seem to be three in a row, but they may have been testing something or checking something out. The guys seem to be milling around. So I think that was kind of a training exercise. Now, here you go. That's a pretty big splash. All right. They got to go in nice and easy. The water has got to be calm. It's got to be as calm as this floor right here. This one's either practicing or testing it. They're pushing up some waves. They're moving some waves. And I think they moved at four miles an hour or four, um, four knots, four point knots, five knots. They didn't move, they moved, um, but not that necessarily that fast or anything like that. Okay, this is from a film testing it and everything like that. It does, it did work. It did work pretty good. It moved okay like that. So we've talked about the Allied situation prior to D-Day. We talked about Omaha Beach, how wide it is, the cliffs and everything. We talked about the German defenses with the, the um, resistance nests and all the weapon systems. We talked about the tanks. What about the tankers themselves? Where did they train? The infantry trained here. I don't think any of the tankers trained at the assault center here, but the tankers trained at Slapton Sands in Devon, England. The, um, let me flip it over. At the Slapton Sands, these tanks were top secret. The tankers weren't supposed to tell anybody. They weren't even supposed to tell their supply sergeants. A lot of their training was done at night. Each tanker received a life vest, breathing apparatus, and enough air for seven minutes. And they practiced getting out of a sunken tank. They were taught how to operate the tank in the water and when they get onto the beach. One tank commander said that for the DD tanks, Every detail had to be learned and there were 23 steps in writing that had to be accomplished prior to launching. The canvas screen, filling the air struts and making sure they were locked, all had to be done 100% correctly. All the controls were near the driver, so he was definitely key. I believe every step must be done 100% accurate. You don't want one mistake with this at all. During training, one tank sank after going 15 feet, but the Navy guys were able to pull them out. Now, what were the tankers? wearing at the time. Pretty good example of the tankers. And if you look at my tankers uniform right here, you see the helmet on top with the earpiece and the throat mic, binoculars, that's a jacket. He's got his web gear and the, the uh, holster on the other side. And this thing right here, if you can see where my pointer is, that's called the bib. It's kind of like overalls. They go on the top of him. There's a blanket lining inside of that. And if you guys haven't come to pick it up and touch it, please do. That's pretty heavy. They wore that at the, at the landings. If they went into the water, how heavy do you think that is and everything like that? Now with the blanket inside, it was um, pretty nice during the Battle of the Bulge in the winter time, having a blanket inside. But at that time, it was um, um, a little bit different. So we talked about the training and the tankers. What about the US plan? There's the plan for General Giroux, commanding general's plan for the invasion at Omaha Beach. They were all lined up, timed and everything. Both the 741st and the 743 tank battalion set their tanks up the same way. B and C company in the first wave with the DD tanks. First wave DD tanks. DD tanks right here. Second wave was the DW tanks, A company. A company, second wave DW tanks, and then the infantry was right behind. These were only a few minutes apart. And the engineers were also up front too. I don't, I don't mean to forget them, but they were information, they were out. The DD tanks would be launched 6,000, 7,000 yards out. If the waves were rough, they would launch them a lot closer. The DD tanks were supposed to land before the infantry and start engaging the Germans. The DD, DW tanks were in the second wave and dropped off in seven feet of water and the infantry is right behind. 
The 741st supported the 16th Regimental Combat Team. Their objective was to secure the beach in two hours, secure the exits in three hours, and move inland for five miles, and then link up with the British at Gold Beach. All that was supposed to be done on D-Day itself. 743rd had the same thing, secure the beach in two hours, secure the exits in three hours, move inland for five miles, but the next day they link up with the 4th Infantry Division at Utah Beach. That was all done in the first day. <laughs> that means if H hours at 0630, the beach is secured at 830 and the exits are secured at 930. Down here is the exits. Those are first IDs. This is uh, 29th and you see the resistance nests right there <laughs> where the Germans were and everything. Excuse me for a second. Okay, here's another look at the plan. But right here, here's where their objectives were. 29th objectives, first ID's objectives right here. Then first ID would link up with the British at Gold Beach. <clears throat> Getting ready for the invasion, June 2nd. As the US tankers and infantrymen and engineers and Air Force are all getting ready, the assault troops loaded up on their respective ships, landing craft and sank anchored in the harbor through June 3rd. June 4th, in heavy seas, they moved into line, but due to bad, they moved into line, sat and waited. June 5th, the, the invasion was scheduled for June 5th, but due to bad weather, it was delayed. Now here's a photo of A Company 741st on one of their LCTs getting ready to, uh, to land and everything like that. These are DW tanks. And uh, the first tank is an M4A1 Sherman. And this one here is an M4 Sherman. These LCTs were flat bottomed and they rolled and pitched and the troops got seasick. A lot of them didn't eat anything. The ones that did not eat any food were not too happy with the ones that did. I'll leave it at that. That also went with the infantry guys too. <clears throat> June 6th, everybody is set and ready to go. The tanks are on their LCTs, the infantry are on the landing craft, the Navy, the Air Force, everybody. June 6, 0400, US wake up call. Okay guys, wake up, get ready. 0445, tank engines are turned on, making sure all the tank engines are working, the tank engines are turned on. At 0530, the US Air Force wakes up the Germans by dropping 13,000 bombs on them. That's a hell of an alarm clock. For the Germans that hit the snooze button, 20 minutes later at 0550, the Navy opened fire with their naval guns. Germans were definitely awake. And the landing crafts were on their way. 0630, sometimes a little bit, few minutes beforehand, the tanks hit the beaches. <clears throat> the LCTs were on the move towards the beaches with the other tanks and the landing craft. For the 741st, the DD tanks were in the first wave. At 6,000 yards, three and a half miles, the LCT stopped, dropped their ramps, the tanks, the DD tanks drove out, went into the water, and many of them went right to the bottom of the channel. For the, seven, for the 741st, the amphibious attack was basically a disaster before it even started. One LCT dropped its ramp and four Sherman DD tanks went right into the bottom of the channel right away. Most of the DD tanks made it off the landing craft and started swimming forward but after a few minutes, they started taking in water. And um, when they started taking in water, the canvas started to collapse. They were launched too far out and the water was too rough. The water started coming over the canvas and the canvas collapsed. Like I said, the tanks and the crew went into the channel. For B Company, five DD tanks made it to shore, 11 did not. For Charlie Company, 741, C Company, all 16 DD tanks sank to the bottom of the channel. The tankers inside the tanks, like the driver and maybe the commander, they had to struggle to get out. The ones outside the tank had to fight the canvas. They had to cut it loose with that knife that they got. And even then the suction of the tank was bringing the, them and the tank to the bottom of the channel. And how cold do you think the channel was? It was icy cold. B Company, 33 out of the 55 tank crewmen drowned. 22 were saved by passing watercrafts. And I read overall that all the tanks that sunk in Omaha Beach, 
65% of the tankers were saved. Only five Sherman tanks made it, the ones from uh, B Company. For A Company, the DW tanks, they made it to shore. They, they, great, they took them to shore and they made it to shore. Now, one of the LCTs sank, so two of their DW tanks and one of their dozer tanks sank to the bottom because of the LT, LCT shore and everything like that. Here's a DW tank on the way to Omaha Beach. I think it actually might be the 743rd, but I've read two different accounts. Like I told you, there's different accounts on different things. One stated that this got damaged possibly from the storm the night before. Another one says that it got hit by German fire. Either way, it made it to the beach, dropped off its tanks, but that's as far as it went. It was not used again or anything like that. You guys seen this photo before? Kind of a famous photo. Here's the infantry landing with one of the tanks up front right there. Well, like I said, some tanks did make it and uh, there they are on the beach and you got the infantry fighting right through. While the 741st was engaging the Germans, the 16th Infantry Regiment on the beach were taking horrendous casualties. They were being shot up on the landing craft, shot up wading through the water, shot up coming up the beach and they were just fighting their way up front and everything like that. They had to get past the obstacles and mines and everything. Infantrymen were wading in chest high to neck high water and were told to drop their flamethrowers, drop their bazookas, drop all their additional equipment or they would drown. They lost many portable radios in the water or the radios got shot up. In many instances, and I read this a couple of times, the tallest infantrymen would be the first one off the landing craft into the water just to see how high it was, how deep it was. Can you imagine a six foot four infantryman going into the water and completely going under? And then the five foot six guy, okay, buddy, you're next, sorry. I, I'm being funny about that, but that's what it was. When they went in, some of them went up to neck high and everything like that. The uh, infantry landed without most of their additional equipment, equipment that they would need. Going back to this map right here, 741st tanks that made it onto the beach engaged the Germans. One DD tank used its 75 millimeter gun to knock out a German, German 88 right here at Whiskey November 1. Whiskey 61, Whiskey November 61. Another DD tank knocked out two 75 millimeter field guns right here at Whiskey November 60. The dozer tanks, they provided covering fire and knocking out bunkers, but the dozer tanks, one tank drowned in the surf, which we're gonna talk about, Two tanks got hit by mines or drove over mines, and five tanks lost a track on those shingles I was telling you about. When they went onto the shingles, the stones got in the track and the tracks popped off. The dozer tanks stole, their blades were invaluable. They engaged the Germans, but also moved the obstacles out of the way. Now, this is from the 741st Unit Journal. Sergeant Beetson, he was with Headquarters Company 741st, and he states that we started firing our 75 millimeter main gun, high explosive rounds, 2000 yards from the shore while on the landing craft. We landed on the beach, continued firing. We removed obstacles. And at one time we got out, put up tow cables on the obstacle and dragged the obstacle out of the way all while under fire. They were doing anything they could to move the obstacles. Sergeant Nickel, A Company, DW tank. We embarked from the LCT and turned left. Another tank turned right and the dozer tank followed. We took a hit in the sprocket wheel and our tank track broke, but we continued to engage. We knocked out one of the emplacements at easy exit three right here. <clears throat> we continued to find targets, but then the water started seeping through the bottom of the tank and the tide was coming in and we had, a tide was coming in over the turret and we had to abandon our tank. Staff Sergeant Fair, we were supposed to land at exit three, but landed at exit one. But when we landed in the water, the water was right up to our turret ring, but we engaged enemy targets. We then moved to a new position and I noticed that the tide was coming in. We were moving through the sand, but there were bodies in the sand and we had to weave in and out of the bodies lying on the sand. Sometimes the medics would move the bodies out of the way. We continued to move. We pulled upon a bank and got stuck in the pebbles. I tried to back up, but the trailer was in the way. I finally unhooked the trailer and while backing up, we threw a track. A lot of that was pretty typical, throwing tracks, getting stuck, but still continuing to engage. Lieutenant Sledge, first Lieutenant Sledge, DW tank. We landed at easy one and the infantry was pinned down, but we couldn't find who was shooting at them. We started moving forward with C Company, 16th Regiment, 
starting to move towards exit one. Then while I was moving with them, my tank drove over a teller mine. Lieutenant McDonough's tank was hitting the gas tank by an 88 and started to burn. Then a DD tank by Sergeant Shepard proceeded through the exit until he was destroyed. And then Sergeant Carlson followed him and he threw a track. Every 741st tank that made it to the beach engaged the Germans, knocked out some bunkers and obstacles, but nearly every tank was either knocked out, destroyed, threw a track, or got stuck or got washed away by the tide. The few tanks that were there though, the, the tanks and the infantry that were there were unable to break through the exits. Second and third waves of infantrymen were coming on the beach and it was just piling up with uh, infantry guys and everything like that. Another thing that was happening was the tide was coming in fast. Both the wounded and the ones that were killed on the beach were going to be pushed into the channel unless they could pull them out. Not only that, the, some of the tanks that were disabled in the water, the water was coming over the tanks on top of them and everything like that. But the tankers and infantry men kept fighting first to break through the exits. For the 743rd, 743rd on this time here, the Navy realized that the water was too rough, talked to the tankers and decided to bring all the tanks into the beach. They realized it was too tall and everything. Some of their DD tanks tried to swim and they sank. A company with DW tanks landed in less defended area and only one tank was disabled. They got all their tanks in there except for one tank got disabled. The 743rd, after they got onto the beach, eight tanks were destroyed by mines. The 743rd uh, had 32 DD tanks, seven DW and three dozer tanks. 42 total tanks got onto the beach. But the Germans outside Whiskey November 72 right here started to engage with 88 and 50 millimeter guns and B Company lost seven, seven tanks to them. The remaining 743rd tanks continued to fight, but then they lost 17 more tanks to the bunkers. They were destroyed, disabled, threw a track, even had engine trouble. But the, seven, but the 743rd still had 15 operational tanks. While everybody's fighting on the beach, US Navy Rear Admiral Carlton F. Bryant, commander of the Omaha Bombardment Force said, we must knock out those guns, meaning the German guns. 12 destroyers open fire. A couple of Navy destroyers moved pretty close to the beach that some people thought they were gonna bottom, our, bottom out. Since radio contact was very little or non-existent, one of the destroyers, the USS Carmack, observed the tankers firing at the bunkers, told the gunners on the destroyer, watch that tracer, look at where the tanks are shooting, and the destroyer started engaging those bunkers and targets and other ones got involved too. And Navy and the tankers started to destroy the German bunkers. The tankers and infantrymen are on the beach taking hits and were fighting hard. This is when Colonel Taylor, commander of the 16th Regiment, 1st ID said, two kinds of people are staying on this beach, the dead and the ones that are going to die. Now let's get out of here. Let's get the hell out of here. Remember the movie, The Longest Day? And it's Brigadier, Brigadier General Coda from the 29th ID that says that by Robert Mitchum. I also read that Brigadier Coda did say something like that. So both of the commanders on the beach said something to get their guys motivated to move on. Anyway, the um, fighting continues. Here's a couple of photos, a couple of the tanks at uh, the beach moving on. That is a medic. The medic has a litter and I'm sure he found plenty of people that could use the litter and everything like that. Here's an aerial view, a couple of DD and DW tanks coming on the beach at Omaha. How this got, I don't know, unless it was an American plane and somebody um, took the photo of it. This guy lost his track right here, Axis Buster. Not to be funny, but I guess he got busted up. This is the mural that's in the museum. If you go to the Omaha beach section, this is the mural that they put out there and everything like that. Going to the initial assault right here. So. Going back to the 741st, at 11 a.m., four and a half hours after the landing, 741st Tank Battalion Commander attempts to push the remaining tanks through EZ-3. He's pushing the 741st through EZ-3, but he only had three tanks left. And then two out of the three tanks got knocked out. And it turns out that all of A Company's tanks were, none of them were operational. The 16th Infantry Regiment continues to break through and they finally break through at EZ-3 and start clearing a path. 
five reserve tanks land for the 741st and they continue to fight through the exit. For the 743rd, 15 tanks were continuing the fight. This is where they landed at 12 noon. This is where they were at 12 noon. This is as far as they got. They made progress, but progress was slow and costly. By 2 p.m., four and a half hours behind schedule, the first of five exit routes through a gully was finally secure. A little later, four more exit routes were secured. 5 p.m., the 741st exited the beach with four reserve tanks. The four tanks that came in, or four other tanks, went on the beach, they finally got through the exit. 8 p.m., 1st Infantry Division controlled a few of the cities here, uh, cities, villages. By 10 p.m., the 743rd exited at uh, Dog 1, at D1 here, the 743rd finally was breaking through. But the two divisions were short of their objectives. They were a mile, they only got in a mile and a half instead of five miles. They did not link up with the British. And the next day they did not link up with uh, Utah. I don't think they linked up with the uh, fourth ID. This is their final positions at midnight. That's as far as they were able to go. It was a brutally hard fight and they did make, they did move up the beach, getting close to their objectives. At 11.15 that night, the 741st Tank Battalion sent their first tank status report to General Giroux's 5th Corps headquarters. Three tanks are combat ready, two tanks are repairable, and 48 tanks are destroyed, okay? That was what they had at that tank. Tanks sinking in the water was a problem. Um, and for the most part, it had nothing to do with the Germans. All those tanks that sank in there, the Germans, um, you know, don't get credit for it, so to speak. But the tanks that made it onto the beach engaged the Germans. They knocked out bunkers, they moved obstacles, they did what they did until um, they got disabled by a mine or got hit or something like that. Here are the problems at uh, Omaha Beach. The German 352nd Infantry Division moved into Omaha. US intelligence thought they were just there by chance and doing an exercise. They didn't realize that the Germans were reorganizing their defenses. They thought it was just the 726th Infantry Regiment. But what the 3rd, 352nd did was put one of the regiments on Omaha Beach with the regiment that was already there. They reinforced Omaha Beach. You tell, US intelligence picked up the information on June 4th that they were in the area. And they pass it down to the two division commanders, but by that time it's too late. They're gonna go on no matter who's there. Another problem at Omaha was because of the low clouds, the Air Force had to drop their bombs from higher up using their instruments and they released their bombs a few seconds later so they wouldn't hit any of their own troops in the ships. And so their 13,000 bombs hit inland and missed the entire beach. The Navy and their initial preparatory gunfire also missed the beach. They all went inland. On Omaha Beach, not one German bunker, pillbox, obstacle mine, machine gun was hit by the Air Force of the Navy prior to the landing. So I guess they woke up the French and not the Germans, but I, I think the Germans still woke up and everything like that. For the landing, the 741st DD tanks were launched too far out and most of them sank. When the infantrymen left their landing craft, they were up the neck high water, they had to make their way to the beach. <clears throat> Since the German positions were not hit prior to the landing, the Germans opened fire on the landing force with everything they had. They weren't touched. All their machine guns, their anti-tank guns were in working order and they were able to use it all to engage. One good thing that did happen is that the German commander, 352nd commander, Lieutenant, German, Lieutenant General Dietrich Kreis was receiving reports that his troops, the German troops had stopped the uh, invasion force at Omaha. He also heard that the US troops had penetrated some positions. These reports were both accurate and inaccurate and confusing because his communications was cut. So he's getting sporadic reports and he's trying to figure it out. But his attention turned over to the British at Gold Beach and at 1225 with permission from 84th Corps, he moves one of his units out and he sends that unit to Gold Beach to stop the penetration of the British. At 135, he reports to the 80, German 84th Corps commander that the US has been thrown back into the channel. And that uh, except for the town of Colville, he is going to attack there. He reported that the US troops were retreating and going back into the water. By um, sending one of his units to Gold Beach, he weakened his defense on Omaha Beach. 
Lieutenant Kraus, Kraus, Kraus was totally wrong. He was right that his troops were stopping the US forces initially, because we were stopped initially, but he was wrong thinking that they were withdrawing. I guess he thought when the, when the landing craft were with pulling out and maybe with some wounded on there, he thought they were leaving. Okay, he was wrong about that. And uh, it was a mistake to move his unit out of his area. There was also confusion in General Bradley's headquarters. With confusion and disorder on the beach, General Bradley and his officers had no idea what was going on. Radio communication was terrible and he couldn't figure out what was going by there. And there may have actually been talk about maybe pulling out or sending even more reinforcements. But by late morning, the US troops started to make progress and eventually they would go through. Here's the results. All right, some historians have different results. This is the best I could put together and everything like that. 12 tanks and six Dozers made it, but eventually, as best as I know, they all got knocked out or destroyed or threw a trap. Five tanks made it, 11 sank. Those five also got hit, and I'm not sure if they got recovered or not. All 16 tanks sunk. According to the 741st Journal, it has B Company, 11 tanks, C Company, 16 tanks missing. Their initial report just had them down as missing. Five reserve tanks did land. By the end of the day, they only had three Sherman tanks that were combat ready out of all of them that uh, launched, out of all of them that launched. 743rd, the Navy took all of them to the beach except for these right here. These are the ones that made it to the beach. And by the end of the day, they had 15 operational tanks. Was it a success? Was a tank support a success and everything like that? Many DW and DD tanks did land and support the landings, but the price was high to pay, especially for the 741st. You cannot deny the bravery of the tankers and the infantry guys and the engineers fighting there. The infantrymen did fight the toughest fight. Yes, it was a success. Here's an interview with the infantry battalion commander of the 2nd Battalion, 116th Regimental Combat Team, 29th Infantry. He expressed his opinion that, and I quote, tanks saved the day. They shot the hell out of the Germans and they got the shell hot shell and they got the hell shot out of them, unquote. Hey guys, this is from an infantryman. When an infantryman compliments tankers, you know the tankers did pretty good. What does Normandy look like today? I'm not sure what those beaches are. I'll just try to get some Normandy beaches. I think this one here is up in the British sector, Gold or Juno. And I'm not sure where these are, but you see they're there. But this is absolutely Omaha Beach. I don't know exactly how many are out there right now, but as far as I know, all the tanks there are still there. Okay. And of course, um, this kind of ends the presentation. And I thank you all for attending. Come on, come on. How do you expect me to finish something like this? All right. All right, our friends on YouTube. <clears throat> Jesus. thunderous Not applause for all of my guests who are attending in person chris and jackie are going to be coming around now with those microphones make sure that if you're asking a question that you have that microphone in your hand before asking but i'm going to get us started with one of our questions from zoom first uh oh i know the germans were already were ready for an invasion in calais but what were our other reasons for not invading near calais um as best as i know one of the reasons was or I don't have to look that way. <laughs> One of the reasons was that from England to Calais, that was the shortest distance. And the US kind of thought that that was very obvious that that's where they would land because it's the shortest distance. Now, if you know anything about Operation Fortitude, Operation Fortitude was the deception that the US, that the Allies used to try to trick the Germans. And one of the things they were trying to trick them was that we'll, we'll land at Pas de Calais. We will land there. So they used Calais, or they used Calais um, as kind of a deception. When they had General Patton as part of that ghost army and that fake army, they used Calais to try to trick Hitler. He was the main one to trick because he controlled everything that they were going to land at Calais. So they was very close. They thought it would be the place to go, but they used it as a deception. That's the best answer I have right now. Uh, what was their communication like? Could they talk with other tanks? Could they talk with the Navy ships? Did they have good radios on board? That kind of thing. Okay. So inside of a tank, you've got an intercom system. So all the tank crewmen can talk. And if you see right here, you got earpiece here. 
throat mic if they want to use a throat mic, and there's a hand mic right here. The tankers talk internally. The tankers talk to other tanks through the radio. But when it came to talking with the Navy, they had to have some type of liaison. They had rate Army radios that they can talk with the Navy. When the first infantry, I don't know about the tankers. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure if the tankers could talk to the Navy. I think they could. Maybe some of the non-tankers, the guys that landed with special radios, special communications, could talk to the Navy. The problem with the infantry is they lost a lot of the radios, their internal radios to talk to each other and to talk to the Navy. The 743rd kept a couple radios. They had a couple, and a couple 743rd guys were able to talk to the Navy, but they lost a lot of communications with the Navy. The Navy wasn't exactly sure. Bradley wasn't exactly sure what was going on, and Eisenhower wasn't. So they had special radios for the Army and Navy to talk. They had radios inside the tank to talk to different tankers, and they had the internal communications and everything like that. All right, Steve, we have a question over here. Of course. Um, on the DD tanks, what happens if the water went into the barrel? Would that flood the tank? If the water went into the barrel, yeah, then the water is going into the canvas, and everything is, is uh, going to sink and everything like that. If water goes into the barrel, you've got to clean out the water uh, pretty quickly. You want to get the water out of the barrel pretty quickly. If water just goes into the barrel, wherever you're at, it won't do a whole lot of damage. But you don't want to keep it You kind of want to clean it as soon as possible. It's like a rifle. When riflemen go through a river, they always keep the rifle up and everything like that. So you want to keep the water out of the tank barrel as best as possible. I have another question over here from our guests on Zoom. Were there any German tanks with the Landing Defense Force in Normandy at any tank battles with the Allies in the initial days after June 6? Okay. So on the initial landings, no. Nope. No. As far as I know, there were not in that area right there. They didn't have any tank battles right away. The 21st Panzer Division, a very strong Panzer Division, was located at Caen, France. I believe Rommel and the other generals wanted it released to attack the British right away, but Hitler kept it. Hitler did not release it. I don't think he released it for 24 hours, if I remember correctly. So after 24 hours, and maybe a day or two, that's when Hitler released, oops, that's when Hitler released some of the tank units, and that's when some of the tank battles are going to start. But on the initial landing, I don't know of any tank tank on tank battles at all, not, not right away. That was part of the deception. Hitler still kind of thought it was gonna be at Pas de Calais, and so he was still waiting for that until they finally convinced them, no, this is the actual invasion and everything. I think I got that right. Any others? I thought it was interesting. You, you mentioned that the tank crew had a certain amount of oxygen to escape the tank. So what was it exactly? A, a little compressed area? Yeah, that's what I think it was. Just... I've never seen one. I've never seen a picture of one. But I guess, so they had the Mae West vest, uh, a life preserver vest. And they had this breathing apparatus. I guess they kept right near them or in their pocket that they would just put in their mouth. And they had like seven minutes worth of air to get out of the tank if they had to do that. Okay, I, I think I mentioned this. I spent 25 years as a tanker, most, most of the time in a tank. If I had to land there, I wouldn't want to, to tell you the truth. But I would rather be in the DW tank, bring me to shore and drop me off and go that way instead of swimming in the tank and everything. All right, I have another question from Zoom over here. During the practice landing sessions in Dover in May of 1944, how was all this preparation held secret against German spies? It was held pretty good. They, they did a pretty good job, except for an incident. During operation or during exercise Tiger, you had tankers and infantrymen doing, um, practicing the landing and everything like that. You had some of the Navy boats around there guarding it. But some German e-boats, swift boats, got into the area and they started attacking the Navy ships and they attacked the tanks that were on landing craft and the infantry guys that are on landing craft. They destroyed a bunch of vehicles and ships and about a thousand, maybe not a thousand, but quite a few hundred US troops were killed. And that was during opera, uh, Exercise Tiger. So the Germans had picked up on it and they, had they engaged them during the exercise. That, would, that attack was kept secret for many years, even after the war, that was kept secret and not telling the public. I think maybe in 1948, it first came out, but um, not a whole lot of it came out. So they were able to keep it a secret as best as they could, keep the Germans away, 
but that at one point during the exercise, the German e-boats came around and found out about it. All right, I have um, a couple of questions coming in through Zoom, especially about reserve tanks. So I'm gonna try and group all of those together into one big question for us, but did they have any tanks in reserve to replace the many that were lost in the initial um, landings? And if so, do you have any idea how many? Okay, so with the 741st, uh, I told you that five reserve tanks showed up, right? A couple of those came from headquarters company. And I think as best as I read, one landing craft was unable to land the tanks. They finally got the landing craft working and those tanks showed up. So they kind of became reserve tanks there. Now, so the 741st and the 743rd though, they landed every tank that they had. They did not have any reserve tanks. Now, follow on forces. In the Omaha Beach, oh, don't have my map. Uh, on the 741st sector, the 745th, the 745th tank battalion was a reserve tank battalion they landed Bravo Company or Baker Company that afternoon. So that was a reinforcement tank company landing at Omaha Beach in the 1st Infantry Division sector. On the next day, A Company and C Company landed. So the 745th landed partially as a reserve unit on D-Day and their other part was B plus one. For the 743rd, the 747th was that reserve unit. That was a reserve tank battalion. They did not land on D-Day they landed at D plus one. So if that answers the question about reserve tanks, uh, each, of the, each of the Omaha Beach had two more tank battalions ready to land to help support on D-Day or on D plus one to get more tanks there to get them inland and everything like that. Good. <laughs> Giving our audience here a chance if they have any questions. Yeah, now just as uh, additional history, the 745th would stay with the 1st Infantry Division, I believe all the way through Western Europe, West in Germany till the end of the war, the 745th did. And the 745th was made up of tankers from the upper Midwest here. And they came here for reunions quite a few times. I went to two of the reunions, I think. Steve, I have a question up here. Go, oh. So you mentioned the 745th being brought in after uh, the 741st and whatnot. Were they also equipped with uh, the kits in order to land in the water as uh, deep wading takes or did, were they pretty much uh, stock and standard? Um, as, as far as I know, they were set up the same way. So they did land on D-Day on D-Day itself. And they, best as, again, the best as I know, they went through the training, they landed the same way. At that time, we really didn't have the setup to land tanks out of the landing ship tanks. We still had to land tanks on DD on the landing craft and everything like that. So they should have been set up. Now, I don't know if they were all DW or DDs or not, but they landed on the LCTs and they went into combat as soon as possible. But as they think all the tanks that landed there did go through the training just in case. Um, they weren't even positively sure if they had to land earlier or later or anything like that. So I think they were all equipped and trained to do that. I would be surprised if they weren't, you know. Well, speaking of training, I have a question over here from Zoom. How much extra training uh, for these tankers did they receive in comparison to other troops? Did in comparison to other training? tankers? Other, or... uh, other troops, albeit okay. infantry. So all the troops that landed on D-Day got extra training on whatever they were specializing in. The engineers got extra training on removing obstacles and demolitions and landing. The infantry got uh, extra training on landing on the landing craft and Bangalore torpedoes and flamethrowers. And the tankers got extra training on going on the landing craft, driving through the water, landing on the beach and um, engaging the tankers and everything like that. So some of the tankers that did not get the extra training were the ones that landed at Omaha <clears throat> on D plus five, on D plus 20, on D, 20 days after D-Day, on D plus 30. They did not get the extra training. There's um, a tank commander that I knew fairly well. He was with the 735th Tank Battalion. And on July 14th or 16th, they put him on an LCT, took him to France, got off at Omaha Beach. He did not go through any of the training. We already had, everything was already secure. They just took him on the beach. He dropped the ramp and he drove on. The ones that got the initial training were the one, the, probably the two tank or the three, ta five tank battalions that landed on DD plus one. I think they're the only ones that got the specialized training. All 
All right, well, we do have time for one more question. And so I apologize if I did not get to everybody's questions this evening, but thank you for sending them in. Um, so for our final question for this evening, for the DD tanks, how did the canvas ring on the air struts, struts stay open with all the water pressure pushing on it from four sides? It doesn't look like they'd be able to do that. So how do they actually stay afloat? Okay, so on the DD tanks, they had a metal platform, whoops, they had a metal platform going around the tank. They welded it onto it. So you can almost get off the tank and step on the platform. Then they put the canvas on top of that platform. And I guess they welded it around the, around the, uh, the platform. And that's how they made it look like a boat. So the canvas was not attached directly on the tank itself. It was attached on a platform going around the tank. And then the canvas went on top of it and it sealed it in there with the air struts with the struts and the air canisters to make it look like a boat and everything. Does that make sense? It had a platform to go around. It had to be on something solid. All right. Well, we thank are? you so much. That was our last question for this evening. So if everybody could just join me in All one right. final pouring thunder of applause for our friends, Steve. Thank you so much, everybody, for choosing to spend your time and your evening with us here at Cantini Park. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and you come by and see us again real soon. Have a safe ride Check out uh, Tank Commander if you want to feel the, how heavy that is and think about how they were when they landed in the water. They had to swim with that. Tomorrow night, we've got cruise night over in the 50M parking lot. We're also bringing in the live operational M5A1 Stewart tank. It's coming out of the motor pool and we will be doing live demonstrations with the tank in the, uh, in the, in the parking lot at 5.30, 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock. Whatever time you show up, you should be time enough to see it and everything like that. All right. Thanks for coming. And uh, I'll be here for a little bit longer. <laughs> Again, thank you to all of our friends who are continue to watch us on Zoom. We appreciate you spending your time with us. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you soon.